He sent His only begotten Son to die at Calvary for our sin. That we may have a way of escape. As the brother spoke of this morning, in a world that's gone crazy. And I believe tonight if we give ourselves more to Him, what's going on around us, in society, in the world, would only bring tears of joy and happiness. Because you know what? We are going, we're a people going somewhere. I my mind that eyes have not seen and ears have not heard. And it has not entered into the hearts of men what God has prepared for us today. Give myself
wonderful. Praise the Lord. If you have your Bible, find 1 Samuel chapter 16, teenagers. Uh, you are going next door. And uh, <clears throat> appreciate uh, the Spirit of the Lord tonight. Thank you for coming. Uh, ready to worship the Lord. And um, I'm thankful for the times he meets with us, how he's uh, faithful to us. He takes care of us. And I'm thankful for that. 1 Samuel chapter number 16 tonight. 1 Samuel chapter uh, number 16. And uh, praise the Lord. Let's see here. <laughs> Technology issue there just for a second. There we go. Uh, 1 Samuel chapter 16. And let's look there at verse number 1. 1 Samuel chapter number 16 and uh, verse number 1. And we'll read a few verses here and see what the Lord has for us here tonight. Regina, what did you do to everybody? Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Right? We can preach on the goats and the sheep tonight. Then, can't we? Hey, hey, hey. The sheep's over this side. Uh, all the sheep's over there. Mm -hmm. I believe some of these on this side probably have some uh, uh, debate about that. All right. <laughs> 1 Samuel chapter number 16. Uh, look at verse number 1. We're going to read uh, through this chapter. Not, uh, not all the verses, but most of the first half of the chapter here. 1 Samuel chapter 16 and verse number 1. The Bible said, And the Lord said unto Samuel, How long wilt thou mourn for Saul? Seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel, feel thine horn with oil and go. And I will send thee to Jesse, Jesse the Bethlehemite, uh, for I have provided me a king among his sons. If you'll remember back in uh, the book of Judges, the Bible said the Bible, it ended uh, the, the book there, the book of Judges ends with, and there was no king in Israel, and every man did that which was right in his own eyes. And Israel wanted a king like everybody else had. And they chose themselves a king, and they chose Saul. Saul, the Bible said, Saul was head and shoulders, shoulders above the rest. And he looked like somebody that would be a king, but he was not God's choice. And here the Bible says uh, that he sends Samuel down to Jesse's house. and said, I've provided myself, or provided me a king, among his sons. And uh, verse number four there says, And Samuel did that which the Lord spake, and came to Bethlehem. And the elders of the town trembled at his coming and said, Comest thou peaceably? They're just This is commercial here. Uh, there was a time that people would respect the man of God. There was a time that people would respect uh, the office uh, of, the, of the, the man of God. And I'm I'm not here tonight to, to try to get anybody to bow down to me or anything like that. I think it's a sad day in society uh, that we have preachers, number one, that do not live up to the office. And then we have people uh, that will not um, respect the office. It's just a, a bad situation. But here in verse number four, they asked them, said, uh, they, the Bible said they were trembled that he came because uh, they, they knew he had the power of God on him. And you know, I, I think probably a lot more uh, in our world, we would see a lot more people uh, in our world that had some sort of reverence about them if, if preachers, and I'm just not preaching to the pulpit tonight, if preachers would pay the price to have the anointing and the power of God on them. Uh, I think our Christians as a whole would be respected a whole lot more if we, had, we would pay the price to have the anointing and the power of God on us. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Uh, look with me in verse number five. And he said, peaceably, I am come to sacrifice unto the Lord. Sanctify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And he sanctified Jesse and his sons and called them to the sacrifice. Verse number six. And it came to pass when they were come that he looked on Eli and said, surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said unto Samuel, Look not on his countenance or on the height of his stature, 
Because I have refused him. Don't matter what the world thinks. Don't matter what the popularity contest says. If God has refused you, you're no good. I, I think it might get a little quiet right there. I would rather have the approval of heaven than the applause of men. Amen. Verse number eight. Then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. And he said, Neither hath the Lord chosen this. I, sometimes it makes me chuckle when I read the Bible how it words things. I mean, somebody walks before you and it's, it's somebody's son and uh, the Lord said, I ain't chose this. You gonna break this out to me? Neither hath the Lord chosen this. Then Jesse made Shema to pass by and he said, neither hath the Lord chosen this. Again, Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. Samuel said to Jesse, the Lord hath not chosen these. And Samuel said unto Jesse, Are here all thy children? And he said, There remaineth yet the youngest. Behold, he keepeth the sheep. Now notice verse number 11. And Samuel said unto Jesse, Send and fetch him, for we will not sit down till he come hither. Uh, would to God we'd get some people to have the attitude about us. I'm not going to rest until what God has chosen stands before me. I'm not going to sit down until the one that God has chosen, the thing that God has chosen, uh, the purpose that God has chosen is in front of me. Verse number 12. And he sent and brought him in. Now he was ready with all the beautiful countenance and goodly to look to. The Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. Verse 13. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of the brethren. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. Tonight I'm going to preach a message uh, I, I told you this morning uh, for the next little while. I'm going to be preaching uh, messages by request. Um, several years ago, I preached this message. In fact, it was nine years ago the Lord gave me this message. And I preached this message and I posted it out on the internet. And uh, I checked on it here the other day. And uh, over eight, uh, uh, about 2,000 people have chosen to go and listen to this message. And I thought, man, that's a blessing. And uh, then I got to reading it again. And I said, well, I can see why. That's all right. And so I want to share with you tonight uh, this message. When the world sees a shepherd, God sees a king. When the world sees a shepherd, God sees a king. Jake, help me on, be sure that the monitors are turned down on this. I want you to watch this. Movie. Grace Athena High School in Rochester, New York, has a new, most unlikely hero, a special ed student by the name of Jason McElwain. Excuse me, go Jason is the basketball team manager. For the past couple years, he's been assisting coach Jim Johnson, helping with whatever the team needs. Get him moving in our hand out water and just be enthusiastic. Enthusiastic to say the least. Despite being born with autism, Jason's father says his son has never had a problem expressing himself at basketball games. You know, I was always concerned that he might get a technical when they lose a game because he, you know, started yelling or whatever. I said, well, hard practice tomorrow. All hour and a half, and let's get ready for a kid. Yeah, let's go. One, two, three, two. Because he has been so devoted to the team. For the last game of the season, Coach Johnson decided to let Jason actually suit up. Not to play necessarily, just to let him feel what it's like to wear a jersey. At least that was the plan. But with four minutes to go in last week's game, Coach Johnson stood up and pointed to number 52, Jason McElroy. After years of fetching water and toweling off other people's sweat, Jason was actually in a game. 
His first shot was a 20 footer from the right baseline. Was it close? Did you almost make it? I just air balled it. <laughs> I'd like to steer God, please. Let's just get him a basket. His second shot missed too, but the third was a chunk. A three point no doubter. And Jason wasn't done yet. Not by a long shot. If I wasn't there to witness it, I wouldn't have lived it, you know? You caught fire. I just caught fire. I was hot as a pistol. Jason ended up shooting six three-pointers. One right after the other. He had 20 points total. And each time a shot went in, his teammates and the crowd went a little crazier. His last basket, right at the buzzer, created total mayhem. Because he is autistic, Jason says he's used to feeling different, but never this different, never this wonderful. Steve Hartman, CBS News, Rochester, New York. As you watch that story, I can't help but think about David. Old David was always looked over, picked over, chosen before, but when it was time for God to make a choice, he was God's choice. And I got to thinking about that young man there and how that uh, about the, the, the story says that he his job was to go and run and fetch water for everybody else. And I thought about old David. The Bible said that while his brothers were fighting, while the, the men of Israel were fighting, what was his job, Brother Robert? His job was, he said, take some bread down there, take some cheese to your brothers, check them, check on them, see if they're okay, and then get back to the, uh, to the sheep, uh, get back to watching over these little sheep. Uh, and in fact, when he got there, he was reminded of that. And I got to thinking about how uh, that we look on the outside, we look uh, on the countenance of a person, and we look on the stature of a person, and we look on all the externals, uh, but God God sees much deeper than that. And God sees much more than that. And so while everybody else just overlooked little David, while everybody else just said, that's the runt of the litter, that's the least of them, that's the youngest one, God said, that's my choice. That's the one I want. I see a king in him. And I wonder God, tonight, while everybody else is looking at you, while everybody else is looking at me, I wonder how how many of us have been overlooked by this whole world? We've been overlooked by the things of the world. We've been overlooked by everything and everyone. But I'm glad to say God still looks down. And he can see a king in you. He can see a king in me. Hey, child of God, look up, weary pilgrim. Can I tell you this? God sees more in you than you do. God sees down on the inside what you can be in you. Amen. Amen. Let's look tonight. I believe every one of us tonight can be used by God. We can learn some lessons from the life of David. Look in verse number 11. The first lesson we learn is he was not haunted by past disregard. In verse 11 said, Samuel said unto Jesse, Are here all thy children? He said, There remaineth yet the youngest. Behold, he keepeth the sheep. Haunted by past disregard. You know, I cannot help but think with David, he had gotten somewhat used to, he had gotten somewhat accustomed to being overlooked. He had been so, somewhat gotten used to being left out. He had, he had got accustomed to not being appreciated. He had been accustomed to being shunned. He had been accustomed uh, to be, not being included. Uh, he had been accustomed to everybody else being involved. Uh, but he always had to know his part. Uh, he had to know his place. Uh, he had to know his role. Uh, uh, but I'm glad, hallelujah, God can turn things around. Uh, I'm glad uh, when it was time uh, to put somebody in the king's palace, uh, God said, I know just the man. I know the one that will do the job just right. Can I tell you this? You may have been overlooked. You may not have been regarded in your past. They may have walked out and left you. They may have overlooked you. They may have shunned you. But I'm glad to tell you, when God's on your side, you've got the majority. I've got the majority. I don't need the popularity in this world. I don't need the contest. All I need is God Almighty with me. I uh, 
I went to Bible college with a, this boy. He was a little bit young, older than me, uh, a few years, I, I suppose. And uh, on the outside, he, he looked like, you know, he was in, had everything in order. He came from a very conservative church, and uh, his dress was always up to par. I mean, he knew the right things to say. Uh, he hadn't been saved real long, uh, but man, he, he knew the Bible. He would sit and read the Bible and study the Bible. Then I got to finding out more about him. His name is Patrick. And um, he, as a child, he, I, what I understand, either his mother died or his mother was out of the picture. I'm not sure exactly how that happened, but he's left with his dad. And his dad didn't want him. And uh, he was just a little boy. And his dad just wanted to go party and live it up and all that stuff. And he would lock him in the closet while he went out on the town, while he went drank and party and danced and all that. And then he'd be gone for hours. He'd come back and if, if little Pat had made an accident, had an accident there in the closet, Brother Ronnie, his daddy would beat him. He would whip him, he would shame him. He said, now boy, don't you cry. Don't you dare cry. You won't get any food, and you won't be able to go to the bathroom if you cry. His life was like that. Every week, I follow, he's a friend of mine on social media. I, I enjoy social media because I can keep up with some of what the Lord's doing in many of my friends' lives that I don't have opportunity to be involved with on a regular basis. But every week, Miss Darrell, he tells about some things that God's doing in his life. He, he's got two main ministry positions that he does right now. One is he is the director of the Garden City Rescue Mission. And every week they house, clothe, feed hundreds of men. They also have a, uh, or had a women's shelter. I'm not sure how that all goes right now. But uh, Brandon, every week, Hundreds of men are ministered to. Uh, they're given the gospel message every Sunday and every uh, on the midweek. Uh, they go over to the Victory Baptist Church and they hear the gospel message. And there were many, many times, Brother Robert, while I was there, and I know this has, has continued. Uh, when the invitations come, they typically would all sit in one section just for ground control and all that. Uh, you would see them fight the hell <laughs> You'd see those broken lives, people standing up, and they'd file out of that section. they come and fall and fold up in an altar somewhere and begin to weep their way to God. They'd go up there and get baptized, and you'd see them in the weeks to come, and they'd testify about what God was doing to them and what God was doing in them. And his job is to oversee that, but that's not it. That's not all. Every week he goes to a state prison every, I believe it's every Friday night. He goes down to a state prison. It's about an hour drive from where he's at. And Brother Robert, every week he testifies of the many, sometimes dozens, that are saved through the power of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, Raymond, I would have chosen a little boy locked up in a closet, beaten, sniveling, shivering. But God saw a king in him. God saw more in him than he ever saw in himself. God saw more in him than his daddy saw. God saw more in him than his family saw. God looked down on the inside of him and said, there's somebody I could use. Can I tell you this? I don't know where you've been, what you've been through. I don't know where you came from. But I can tell you wherever you came from, there's a God in heaven that knows just exactly where you're at. There's a God in heaven that while everybody else may overlook you, they may shun you, uh, they may leave you, uh, uh, they may not have anything to do with you. Uh, I'm glad, praise be to God, we can be reminded. 
reminded why they didn't choose me. God chose me. And he is the only one that matters. What is it that the devil keeps bringing up out of your past to try to keep you from serving him today? Well, preacher, you know, I would be more involved. I would do more for God. I would step out in faith. But you don't know my past. You don't know what happened. You don't know what I did. I might not. But God does. And if God's calling you, the Bible said the gifts of calling of God are without repentance. If God's calling you, I don't care what every deacon board from here uh, to South Carolina and back, I don't care what every advisory board, I don't care what every uh, preacher fellowship, I don't care uh, what, what a group of people, I don't care what WMU has to say about it, I don't care uh, what brotherhood uh, has to say about it. Uh, if God has put his finger on you uh, and God has put his touch on you uh, and God is calling you, uh, you just go ahead and leave your past behind uh, and walk on uh, in the power and the glory of God. Amen. Amen. Number two, he was not halted by his present duty. Verse number 11 goes on and says, Behold, he keepeth the sheep. Samuel said to Jesse, Send and fetch him, for we will not sit down till he come hither. Now, you know the story of a shepherd. A shepherd has no respect. It's a demeaning job. It's a job that is looked at with great disdain. Uh, it's not something that you say, man, I'm going to go to school, I'm going to go to college, and maybe one day I'll be a shepherd when I grow up. Uh, David was left to be a shepherd because all of his brothers were off doing their career. They're off living their life. They're off doing their thing. And he was left at the low, low man on the totem pole. He was left to keep the sheep. And Samuel said, we're going to stand. We're going to wait till he gets here. Now, when I was in uh, high school, I went to North Gaston High School. Go Wildcats, right? Eric. And uh, Eric and I graduated together. I, I might have told y'all that Eric had perfect attendance from kindergarten all the way through 12th grade. I mean, that, that just is unreal to me every time I think about that. And uh, I don't know where he graduated in the class, summa cum laude and all that kind of stuff. I didn't get none, none, none of that stuff in high school. Um, I didn't graduate with honors. I did get a scholar's diploma somehow. And um, it, when we were in, back then it was just 10th and 11th grade or high school and then 12th grade, of course. And when we were in 10th grade, Eric, can you remember this? When we would have a, a, a whole school assembly, we would have to stand while the seniors entered into the auditorium to show them respect. And so 10th graders and 11th graders would have to stand until all those seniors got there. And they, when they had their seat, then we could be seated, we could be seated as well. And what they were teaching us is that your time's coming. If you'll stay diligent, you'll be faithful, you'll get to be here one day. And Brother Robert, it never felt so good to the first time we had assembly. And I was finally a senior. And they said, please rise as the seniors enter the auditorium. And man, we came walking down through there. We came strutting down through there. We came walk. I mean, I was talking about I had some mm, mm, in me. Just, just look at at them lower class men. That's right. You respect me. And we went and sat down. I got to thinking. Older brothers and younger brothers. You're the second, I believe, Eric. And uh, I ain't got to ask this. But I can guarantee you there's a whole lot of fights 
over on uh, that road. And it probably had to do with his two younger brothers and him. And every once in a while, he just had to put a whooping on them, right and remind him he is the, he is the oldest brother, except for Shane. And uh, Shane may have whooped you a couple of times. I don't know. But uh, y'all ain't going to believe this, but I had to whoop that boy right there many a time. Many a time I had to remind him who's the boss. No, nah, we, 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 we did fight a lot. But, uh, but you know what? One thing I learned about brothers, the Bible said there were seven of them, Brother Rob. And here's David, the youngest one. They done brought Eli and said, surely this is the one. No, this ain't it. They bring all the rest of them. No, this ain't it. And then Samuel said, we're going to stand Till David gets here. Can you just imagine them boys? I ain't believing this. We gotta stand and wait on that little punk. We gotta stand and wait on that little uh, man. He, uh, uh, he gets on my nerves. And they go, he, he's the prophet, the man of God. Don't he know? We gotta stand and wait on him. Here comes David. They said, David, your daddy wants you. And the prophet's here. David comes skipping down through there. David comes running, running down through there. And here he comes. And, and, and God had saw him. And God had a plan for him. God had a purpose for him. And I'm telling you what, praise be to God, uh, that David that day stood uh, and had the anointing flow on him. Uh, as the prophet poured out the anointing, he, he all of a sudden, uh, he forgot about uh, what his job used to be, uh, uh, where it came from, uh, how many times he'd been overlooked, uh, how many times he didn't get respect. Uh, now, uh, he's anointed, and he's not just anointed by the prophet, he's anointed to be the king of Israel. He did not halt in his present duty. He could have said, I can't do this. And there ain't no way I can do this. This is not, you got the wrong person. You didn't pick the right one. The Bible said that Samuel anointed him there, king over Israel. Let me give you a verse. I think I'll put it in here in our uh, text here. There it is. 1 Samuel 17 verse 28. 1 Samuel 17, if you remember the story, they're down there fighting Goliath. His brothers. The Bible said Eli Eli's anger was kindled. Now, this is after the anointing. Eli's anger was kindled against David. He said, why can't we stand hither? With whom hast thou left those few sheep in the wilderness? You know, people always wanted to remind him of who he was. Wanted to remind him of his current lot in life. You know, it is possible that God have a calling, God have an anointing on your life that is greater than your current position. God has called you to more than you are right now. I remember I was going off to Bible college and I had taken a job, I got a job and uh, I was training in Charlotte and was going down to Aiken to work there and, uh, while I was in Bible college. And uh, just to be honest with you, it, I knew going in this was not going to be my favorite job I ever had or anything like that. It was a good job, paid well, all that kind of stuff. But I just, it was not something that I knew I was going to love. And uh, there was a lady that was training me, and she had been doing this job for years. And uh, she, in, in discouragement, she said to me, she said, sometimes I get so discouraged with my life. I don't know what all had gone on in her, in her life. I don't remember if she had never been married or whatever, it didn't work out, I'm not sure what it was. But she was very discouraged and she said, I, I, I get so discouraged with where I am in life, I didn't think things would be this way. And 
God gave me a little nugget that day, Brother Ronnie. And I told her this, and God spoke it back to me many, many, many times. I said, ma'am, you are more than what you do. Just because your job is to do this, that doesn't mean that God has, that's all God has planned for you. Sometimes you got to do what you got to do to pay the bills. Sometimes you got to do what you got to do. And it might not be the position you dreamed of. It might not be the position and the situation you prayed for. But God's got an anointing on your life. And God's got a purpose for your life that's greater than where you stand right there. And as David was watching those sheep, and David was listening to all that talk, and go back home to those sheep. And you out here missing, you're just looking for something to get into, David. You're all always trouble. David had to remind himself, what I'm doing right now is not everything God has called me to do. It's not everything God's going to allow in my life. Hey, I'm here to tell you, a child of God, where you're at right now is not the end of the story. God has a better plan. God still will keep his word. What is it? That you're doing. That the devil is telling you. That you're just stuck. You'll never get out. Of the situation you're in. You'll never. Get past. Where you are. It'll always. Be this way. You know it's easy. When you're in debt. It's easy. When you're in pain. It's easy when your health is gone. It's easy when it seems like friends have gone. It's easy when things have fallen down around you to get into your mindset, it will always be this way. You know, Joseph could have felt that way himself. There he was in a prison. He'd been lied on, thrown in a prison, been forgotten about. His brothers, his own brothers, uh, sold him, told his dad that he's dead. All that stuff's happened. No doubt he could have sat in that prison and thought, I'm just going to die here. I ain't dying yet now. There's no way that this can turn around. And you know what God did? God elevated him. Just like that. Amen. Said, Joseph, Pharaoh wants to see you. Get up, take a bath, shave yourself. You're going to stand before Pharaoh. And in just a matter of hours, Joseph went from forgot about, despondent, depressed, to second command to the entire known world. And you're going to tell me that God's forgotten about you. You're going to tell me that you're stuck where you're at. The same God that remembered Helena. The same God that remembered Joseph. He knows your name. He knows everything about you. He knows the hairs on your head. He knows exactly how you feel. He knows exactly where you're at. And so don't get in your mind. And do not believe the devil's lie. That you're stuck where you're at. That it will always be this way. I'm here to tell you. That God has more inside of you. Than you believe. And God has more inside of you. Than this world believes. God has more inside of you. And that the devil's telling you. God has an anointing. On your life. He's calling you. You, uh, uh, to more than you are right now. So just go ahead and believe God even while you're stuck in your position. I'll give you this last one now. Hush. Verse 13. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brethren. <laughs> Brother, a little further, don't you find it interesting? Not only that, to stand until that punk got there, he anoints him right in the middle of all of them. That might not mean a whole lot to you until you've been shunned, until you've been overlooked, until everybody else has counted you out, 
until everybody else said you're done for, you're washed up, God will never, God can't ever, God would never. And here's David and the prophet anointing him with oil. I don't know how many of you were coming to church here uh, a while back. I'd ask uh, Eric to help me uh, with a message, and I'm not going to do that tonight. It's an entirely different message. But that anointing, I'd always thought that it was just a little old cruise of some sort, kind of like what we have when we go anoint a little bottle or something, they just kind of poured it on them. But that anointing was over a gallon. It was common to be well over a gallon that they would make and they would pour it out all over. The Bible said in Psalm 133, how good and how pleasant it is for the brethren to dwell together in unity is like the oil that ran down Aaron's beard. Think about that oil, Brother Fraley, because when somebody had the anointing on them, wherever they went, they carried it with them. Whoever they were around would be influenced by the anointing. There was, a, there was an aroma that it carried. The Bible said, then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brethren. And the spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. Just, just a little doctrine here to help you. In the Old Testament, they did not experience the Spirit of God, but the power of God and the infilling and the presence of God like we do in the New Testament. Jesus said, I pray I, that he, well, as he was praying, that he's going to send another comforter and that he would come and he would be inside of us. And he would lead us to all truth. In those days, Miss Carolyn, the Holy Spirit would come on a man. And when the Spirit was done doing what it was going to do, it would leave. It would come back on a man as need be. Remember Samson. The Bible said that Samson, the Spirit of the Lord would come on him. He'd tear things apart. And he just kept on playing and playing and playing. And he thought that everything's going to be all right. It's always happened this way. God's always uh, been through, come back, and God's always helped me. And the Bible said that he whispered. The Spirit departed. Some of the saddest words in all the Bible. But the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament would come on a man. The Bible said the Spirit of the Lord came upon David. From that day forward. Brother Frederick, does that mean that he was indwelt by the Holy Spirit? No. That was not the ministry of the Holy Spirit at that time. He would come on David from that day forward. As the Holy Spirit did in that time, the Holy Spirit would come on David. Saul, what did the Bible say? That the Holy Spirit left. Saul. Because he disobeyed God. That's 1 Samuel chapter number 15. Disobedience is as a sin of witchcraft, witchcraft uh, is as a God, uh, or dis or rebellion is a sin of idolatry. And that's what Saul did. But here, David finds out that just because everybody overlooked me does not mean that God does not have a plan for me. It did not hinder his promised destiny. Just because they didn't think he should. Just because they overlooked him, just because he was not their choice, it did not mean uh, that it wasn't God that came on him. Did you remember that little video we showed right before? I, I don't know how much the Spirit of God had anything to do uh, with how, what happened that day, but I just, I just uh, choose to believe that God helped that little boy. Uh, he had some problems in his life. Uh, he had difficulty in his life. Uh, and, and he had never even made a bucket before, never been in the game before, and he shot six three-pointers in a row, uh, uh, including the one at the buzzer. You gonna tell me uh, that something supernatural didn't happen? I tell you this: uh, uh, something supernatural can come on you. Uh, something supernatural can happen in your life. Uh, I'm telling you, praise be to God, uh, that there's a God in heaven uh, that will take you uh, to your promised destiny. 
Verse number 19. Verse number 19. I've got it there. It said, Wherefore, Saul sent messengers unto Jesse. And this is back in my text. Uh, Saul sent messengers unto Jesse and said, Send me David thy son, which is with the sheep. Now, he's anointed in verse 13. The Spirit of God comes on him there in verse 13. Now he's called to do a service. I think there's a lot of people that get jealous. Well, I don't know why they get used by God. I don't know why God blesses them. I don't know why God is doing this in their life. I don't know why God keeps on. It seems like this keeps happening in their life. They forgot there's a price that they paid. There was anointing that was put on them. The Holy Spirit came on them. One thing I've had to remind myself, Mr. Edge, over the years, as I've seen people rise and people fall, you look at them and you think, why can that not be happening in my life? Why is my ministry not doing that? And what I've learned is this, that's God's business on how he'll do with that person. It's my, it's the only thing I need to worry about is me. God, am I doing what you want me to do? Because if I'm doing what you want me to do, if you want to elevate me, if you want to lift me up one day, you will. One thing I've learned is when God lifts you, the attacks come in greater fashion because you're out to be seen. I'm not saying you're doing to be seen. I'm, I'm saying the enemy can see you a lot more. I said this before and I'll say it again. You will never minister effectively. Your talent will never be able to keep you where you are. Well, you'll, never be, you'll never be able to live there's a, there's a quote here. You'll never be able to live in a place that your talent can take you if your character won't keep you there. Right? There's a lot of us. God has done a lot of wonderful things. But if we don't allow the Holy Spirit to have reign in our life, we'll get ourselves messed up. Even like David. David was supposed to be fighting. David got in a mess. The girl named Bathsheba and her husband and all that. You know the story. Because David wasn't where David needed to be. Just because God touched you in the past does not mean that you can just do anything you want to and get by with it. Well, don't they know? I uh, there's a situation that I'm uh, fairly knowledgeable about. This happened years ago now, and uh, this man had a role in a uh, in a drama, and it was uh, like Christmas and Easter and things like that. He would always have a starring role in drama. And done a tremendous job depicting the Lord as his role. The man today, Brian, is in jail for messing around with underage kids, messing around with people who were not his wife in jail right now. There was a time. I saw God home. I saw God working in his life. Just because God touched you way back there don't mean you might not reap the seeds you were sowing outside the will of God. The, the, this message I, I've preached before, but I haven't preached this before. God's just giving, giving this to me right now. <sighs> 
who did not hinder his promised destiny. Verse number 19. Saul is troubled by an evil spirit. How, how do you reckon they knew about me? What do you think got him this position? Got him to be called to where he was? Let's, let, let's read verse number 21. He's called by Saul. The Bible said David came to Saul, stood before him, and he loved him greatly. He became his armor bearer. We all know the story. David was the sweet psalmist of Israel. David sang the songs of God. David played the instruments. And David would, would, would do all that. And when the king needed somebody to soothe him, when the evil spirits had come on him, he said, find me somebody that can. And Brother, Brother Ronnie, I believe with all my heart, the reason that they found David is because David was faithful out in the field, out with the shepherd, sheep, out being a shepherd where nobody knew him, nobody heard him. He is singing, hallelujah. He is just singing a song to God. And I believe as they has gone through there in the countryside there at Jerusalem, they hear a song coming over the hills. They say, that's David out there singing again. I don't know why he's singing out there with them sheep. I don't know why he's so happy to be doing what he's doing. I'll tell you why. Because God put a song down his heart. Because God knew that song would lead him where he was going to call him to be. Somebody needs to go to church with me tonight. Tell you tonight uh, that in the mundane, uh, in the lowly, in the no good, uh, and when you overlooked and over uh, picked over, I'm glad to tell you you still have a song in your heart, and that may very well be what God uses to elevate you. Look, this Becky, can you help me tonight? <clears throat> She's gonna slip to the piano there. And uh, tonight, we think about this idea. The world looks at you and looks at me, and all they see is a little lonely shepherd. I'm thankful that tonight, God can still see you. Won't you stand with me as she begins to play this evening? How many of us this, this evening will slip out of our seats? Come and find a place and say, thank you, God, for your mercy. Thank you, God, that while everyone overlooked me, God, you included me. Lord, I want to tell you, thank you, that tonight I am chosen by you. I am included in your number. God, tonight, as discouraging as things can be, as hard as life can be, I want to tell you, God, thank you. Thank you, God, for there is more in me than meets the eye. God, there's more in me than even I can understand and see tonight. I'm thankful that while I look at average, mundane, just enough, God, you see more in us than that. God, I ask you for the anointing on our lives tonight. I pray, oh God, that the power of God will fill us. And when it's time, Lord, you would call us to that position you have for us. I thank you. I bless you for all you've done and what you will do. Take the word of God hide in our heart that we would not sin against you. Lord, we bless you tonight. We believe you. God, remind us 
remind us, God. We look in the mirror. All we can see is a shepherd boy. All we can see is just, there's just another also red. There's one set on the sidelines. There's one left. Lord, I'm thankful tonight. God, you see more than that. Lord, I pray that you remind us of that in the dark hours of our life. Lord, I love you. We bless you in Jesus' name. Father, thank you for your word tonight. I pray that God will take it out of our heart. God, may we remind the devil if he comes to knock on it, I know he will. That though he may not conceal, though anyone around us they may not be able to see it, God sees more in us than this whole world does. God, I'm just reminded you said your word we are joint heirs with Christ. There's a king down on the inside of us tonight. And I thank you for that. Take your word out of our heart. Help us this week to live for you, to reach others for you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for coming uh, to church tonight. I pray that the message is a help to you. Uh, Lord willing, on Wednesday, we're going to look at one of the most popular verses in all the Bible, Romans 8, verse number 28. And uh, so, Lord willing, we'll look at that on Wednesday. You come and see what the Lord uh, speaks to our heart about. Um, I heard a story, and I, I'm not going to keep you, but I heard a story about a uh, somebody had preached and uh, Afterwards, somebody came up to him and said, Preacher, I want to tell you thank you for what you had to say about whatever it was, fill in the blank. What would you have to say about that? And he got to thinking, he said, I didn't say anything. He was thinking, I didn't say nothing about that. And, uh, and he said, yeah, the Lord really spoke to you and told me this and this and thus and thus about what you said. And he said, praise the Lord. And uh, he was reminded on the way home. The Bible said, in Acts chapter 2, every man heard in his own language. The Holy Spirit works more than just with that tongue. The Holy Spirit works on the hearing. So if you'll come to the house of God and you'll ask God, God, let me hear what you want me to hear. This preacher might mess around. This preacher might stumble. This preacher might stutter. This preacher might mess up. But I promise you this. God will still give you the message you need to hear. Amen. 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 All right. Thank you for coming. We'll, come. we'll be here on Wednesday. Look forward to seeing you. Uh, Jason, my brother, if you will, you pray.